Today's participants are Kristen Condon, Richard Gilson. We join the conversation in the faculty lounge. In the power of being on the street with people who were activists. And so I got a whole lot of that um, desire to use whatever kind of creative spirit and energy that I had to be in those places where I thought that people should spend their time and energy. And so I went back after being a painter to... This um, is the year is about... Um, what? I graduated in 1970, so okay. I, was, I was really active in the streets of Chicago in 68 and 69 wow. and 70. And then went to Indiana University to get my um, teaching certificate because instead of being a painter, I wanted to teach in the most difficult schools in the inner city. So you started out as a, as a painter? As a painter. So I was doing landscapes in, in ac and... In acrylics or in... Um, in oil. In oil. Right. Right. Wow. We actually learned in oil back in the 60s. Well, in, in, indeed, uh, my, my stepfather was, a, was an artist. And, yes. And, uh, um, and, and so he, he started out in oil, then he moved to acrylics anyway. Right. So I Most people made that shift then because that's what the oh. New York artists were doing, and acrylics became so much easier because <laughs> it would dry. But anyway, I kept to the oils okay. um, and then got my master's degree in art education and worked in inner city schools. At the same time, my husband was getting um, his degree in social work because this community organizing was and mental health um, was really important to him. And we moved to. So you're in Chicago at this point, or we were. In, we were. We moved from um, the Chicago area then to um, Bloomington. Bloomington, sure. Yeah. University of Indiana. Right. And then I taught in the schools in um, Fort Wayne, Indiana, for a while. And my husband David wanted another master's degree. He had a degree in education and wanted a degree in um, social work. And we moved to Milwaukee, and I got a job teaching in the Milwaukee County Jail. Ah. Uh which was maximum security. No. Yeah, um, in the women's section. And I was in my mid-20s. Um, uh, I this is So in other words, you're, you're teaching right. at this correctional facility? Right, yes. Wow. So every day <laughs> I would go through um, the most incredible search. Like, you know, this is a maximum security jail. Um, I couldn't bring in paints, I couldn't bring in paint brushes, I couldn't bring in pencils unless they were small and they couldn't have erasers on them. Was any bitty, so... It had to be itty bitty because of the potential for abortion. Wow. So crochet hooks had to be counted out, they couldn't be metal, they had to be plastic. Scissors, wow. we had three pairs of scissors that were on the table all times and they were kindergarten scissors. Yeah. Things like staples because they could, they, the correctional officers thought that you could take the staples and jam a lock. So, th the idea of this is, do I understand, is that you saw creativity in the anybody. Right. In the most restrictive kinds I of see. settings. That is These women in this setting were the most creative people that I have ever encountered. Wow. And that, and, and what I had learned, you know, here I was with my graduate degree yeah. in art education, and I believed I was supposed to teach Rembrandt Grant and Van Gogh, yes. and you know, all the, it, how stupid would have that been? Yeah. I'd come in and said, okay, now we're gonna study the great artists. Um, where they were worried about their kids, and they didn't know the difference between a felony and a misdemeanor, um, and they wanted a way of using art as communication. So, so essentially you you have an audience Captive. that is <laughs> I, hate, I didn't want to say you didn't it. want to say it but <laughs> well and actually they weren't they had to have privileges to come to school but they, they were they were there wanting they wanted to learn they wanted to learn more than any wow. students I've ever had what and a I've taught great in, experience right I've taught in all kinds of settings but oh these these were students. I can see it affected you. I oh, can see, I can it see was, that. Yes, right. So for two and a half years I did that. They taught me about the materials. Wow. They, I, you know, here I thought I had good taste and everything. Sure. And I was coming in and showing them the, we were doing some weaving projects and sewing projects. And I was bringing in the fabrics and the colors and the embroidery materials that I thought were just 
so wonderful and of good taste and they just dissed it all. They said, we need polyesters, we need variegated bright stuff, we need all the kinds of things that I'd been taught in school was horrible. I'll be darned. So I, I just had to say, I had to really open myself up. Huh, and in, your th in your own thinking. In my own thinking, in my own education. Huh. And it was because of that experience. Well, I, le I left that after two and a half years and then became a principal of a school for emotionally disturbed adolescent girls <laughs> because I wanted to, I wanted I wanted them not to get to the jail setting. So, so the, it was it was purposeful that you went to the the, the school setting. Yes. The, you were thinking about that. Right. I knew I knew wow. who I cared about. Wow. And I knew what I had to learn, and hmm. I knew that most people didn't want to be in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And I felt very, um, I was compelled to say that if I could do something important in this world, it wouldn't be necessarily working with the high art um, audiences. It'd be working with the people who many people um, disregard or make invisible. Oh, I can see the passion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, this, you're very oh, passionate yeah. about I, this. I am. And this then it, it was from that experience and those women in the jail, yeah. and then my experience is teaching in a residential treatment school that um, I knew I had to go back to school and do it right. Um, in other words, I need to learn and affect had to relearn. education yeah. and art so that people could see creativity in a much broader way huh. than what we usually get in art history classes. Huh. And so I went, uh, well, what I did was so I called everybody I knew saying, could I go study folk art in an art setting? And well, I can name the school Stanford. Oh no, um, Ohio State. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, all these different places. I'm laughing because but I taught it. Right. I taught yes. at Ohio State University. <laughs> no, because it, it just wasn't. It wasn't proper. It was yeah. the lowest form of art. But it was the art that was coming out of the communities of people that I cared about, and I needed to learn about the aesthetics of that those particular groups. And the University of Oregon huh. said, "Oh, yeah." you could come here and do this. We have a folklore program, and um, we would accept that. Wow. So I remember saying to my husband, we were living in Wisconsin, and we had just gotten out of debt from all of the education and everything. We were just, you know, at late 20s, finally had bought our first house, a little teeny bungalow, and we were paying our bills, and we didn't have any loans. And I, I just had this, I just knew. You know how when you just know uh, uh, that uh, it it's just... It's right. Kind of, right. And there I isn't, and, and it's like... Um, you just say, there isn't any discussion, we just yep. have to do it. Yep. So it was um, one of those things where I just said, David, we have to go to the University of Oregon and I must figure out how to do this and make a contribution to um, the art world and to educational settings that validates the creative spirit of people who have been disenfranchised. Wow. So wow. that's what my research is basically about. It's not only disenfranchised. I, I guess you d your specialty is in that area, which is wonderful. Yes, um, it is. But the the celebration that there's creativity in everybody. Right. And right. to and sometimes the best things come out of those places, oh, just like what you were what what your life was like when you were saying that you didn't have a lot of money and you needed to pull yourself out and use what you had to get your education and your schooling. It's your artist father who taught you that. He d yeah, and 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 he uh, when we uh, uh, when I with my stepfather uh, Emery Clark, um, sometimes as an artist he'd make a lot of money, and sometimes we just didn't have any money whatsoever. Right. Um, uh, but he would make, uh, for example, uh, uh, a uh, uh, presents for people. And he made them out of beer cans and coffee cans and oh, roosters yeah. and oh. fish and a variety of things from things that people disposed of on the side of the road. Right, right. So, and so that's a kind of a metaphor in a way for things that people throw away. I mean, we have artists who talk about this and they say that I want to reinvent um, my life and I do that by taking away, taking things that other people throw away and by making those things beautiful, I'm recycling thing objects, I'm I recycling would. ideas, and I'm recycling myself. That is great. Yeah. That is really great. And 
so there's n a number of artists. Um, Mr. Imagination from Chicago who talks about this. Lonnie Holly, who's an artist in um, Alabama or Tennessee, who talks about this. And um, you know, it's just so clear. Um, so oftentimes well, I talk to my students about the blessing that you have been given by not having had everything. Yeah, I, and I truly believe that. Um, uh, and and uh, 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 as a boy, um, I don't rem remember anything. Um, but in a way, it was great because it allowed the world to, to open up yeah. Uh, yeah. at an age where I could really understand it. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was, it was great fun. Tell me. Tell me, how did you, okay, so you're at the other end of the, the United States. I'm in Oregon. <laughs> yeah. how, do you, how do you get 3,000 miles down southeast uh, yeah. to the other, to UCF? Yeah, well, um, my husband went and did his PhD work at Case Western, and I got a job at Bowling Green State University. So you, you were up in so, Ohio. Right, and I was teaching art education and art therapy classes. And um, How did you get there from from? From Oregon? Yeah. Um, well, d after I got my Ph.D., David said, oh, this looks like you had a great time. <laughs> I oh, think I need I to do it. this. And it. so it was sort of his turn to, to go do it. that. And um, Bowling Green was close enough that we could commute. Sure. Um, so for, for a couple years. And I, and, but, but Bowling Green didn't, you know how, they're really, at least for me, and I think maybe for you because in Human Factors you sense that space where you're in where you can really be creative. Yes. And for me when I was in Ohio I didn't feel that space and it's partly because it's an isolated rural community that's mostly white. When I came to Florida and I came here to develop some curriculum in community arts what I sensed was tremendous potential oh, yes. because of all the diversity because huh. everybody is here. You know, that is so, that it's, it's in, a, in almost a parallel way, it's almost the same thing because I came down here for very similar reasons. Oh. It was the right thing and the right place for, yeah. the, for what, for and the area of human, human factors uh, that I do. The, the why, there's a lot of other areas though besides uh, Orlando area. Why UCF? Um, well, you know, I've had my dark days at UCF, let's put it that way, in difficult times. And oftentimes, I think when you do something, when you come into a, a department and say, um, I love art that's not like anything that you oh, usually I teach. I see. But in this particular case, um, there were enough people in the art department faculty who said, I get it. Uh -huh. Even though there were a lot of people who said, I don't get it. There were enough people who said, I get it, that I thought, I can cultivate this here. Good. And also, in the state, mm -hmm. there is a very strong um, folk life program. And so the folklorists in the state became my network. Huh. And um, so, you know, there's always, I think if you do something new or different or you're looking in a different area, there's always that sort of push and pull. And, and I've got to say that part of it's me, too. It, it's just looking at the other side and moving things in another direction. I'm really comfortable on the fringes of things. Yeah. So I, I'm not a central art person. So, so the idea that here's an, I mean, a relatively new emerging university that, is, right. uh, that allows you to do things yes. in different ways. Yes. It was attractive to me, too. I, right. I agree with you. You build the program yeah, you along with your interests. And, right. and so it's not so established. When I was at Bowling Green State University, they asked me and a colleague of mine to um, develop a master's program on anything we wanted to. Huh. And it was a great opportunity because we had a popular culture um, department there that was not in the art department, but, but sort of there seeing what we were doing mm. and got really exciting about it. And so we thought we couldn't really tell the art, studio art people, what it was we were talking about because studio art people aren't readers like, uh, you know, you read and write. I mean, it's not that they don't read, it's just that they spend most of their time creating things. And so we decided that what we really needed to do was create an exhibition that would explain to them what we wanted to do. And so we thought about what kinds of aesthetics are there here in Northwest Ohio that aren't being recognized. Oh. And we thought about the idea of fishing. So we wanted the art of fishing. 
And yeah. um, so we proposed this to the gallery committee, and they said, no way. We proposed it again and gave them all this stack of research that showed there was a foundation for this. And they said, no way, that is crazy. This is a fine art gallery. You're not putting fishing stuff in this gallery. And um, so finally they couldn't get rid of us and they said, okay, if you can go get a grant, ah, then we'll let speaks. you do this. Money okay. speaks. Right. So we wrote a grant to the um, Arts Council in Ohio and got the biggest grant this, that the art department had ever gotten. I'll be And darned. they couldn't say no. <laughs> And this exhibition then was the most loved and the most hated exhibition that they'd ever had at, oh. at Bowling Green State University. It went into field and stream, it went over the AP wires, CNN did something on it, USA Today did a piece on it, and it was just really what we wanted to do. Exactly. You got passion all over the place. Yes, right. It, yeah. it was terrific. I'm, I think that, um, you know, so many articles, we were asked to go around the state doing um, fishing shows. It was such a big thing. And it was funny because neither one of us eats fish. Doug Blandy and I, neither one of us eats fish and we don't fish. Uh -huh. And we don't know anything about fishing. But what we did was we, we found the people who did and let them be the experts. And so they curated the show to show the aesthetic the way they thought it should be shown. So, th so they really wanted well, they took the roles of the academic people. Wow, that is really And see, impressive. they saw themselves then as the artists. So it was after that that you, I don't Then, I then we left. <laughs> it was a really <laughs> hot thing. Um, so the, the art department really became polarized over that. Uh, you know, and, and the university loved it because they got all kinds of awards sure. for it. Um, but it was, it, Ohio really wasn't a place where I was yeah. comfortable anyway, and the opportunity to come here where there's so many diverse kinds of aesthetic right. perspectives and creative um, experiences, it's, it's the best place in the world I to think be. it is, too. I, I yeah. agree with that. And this is uh, the, it, the, you can express yourself, you can do things. Yeah. Um, uh, it has some growing pains like anything does. does. Uh, parking is a little tough. Oh, little parking's tough. horrible. <laughs> yeah. But it, it is a, uh, uh, in expressing ourselves, I, I, it really right. is fun to do. Right, and there's and a bit of a renegade feel yes, to I get UCF and also to the whole state of Florida. I get that too. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, you couldn't have, uh, uh, as a, since I was a faculty member at Ohio State for about 15 years, yeah. you could not have gotten that through in, I don't think, no. uh, at, there, but certainly no. at UCF. No, but it's interestingly, Ohio State is um, doing a lot of really great stuff in cultural-based aesthetics now, what we call maybe that. Um, and maybe because of you guys. Well, we have a lot of friends over there, I, yes, yeah, and we share yeah. a lot of the same kinds of resources. Not in the so era that I was in, the no. 70s, the uh, 80s, that no, wouldn't no, have happened. No, no, no. Very stodgy. No. Right. When you get down here, um, it's, I always think of artists as being uh, what I grew up with. As, as being uh, uh, outside of universities. Right. I, I, my curiosity's up. You're in the film department. Right. I don't, why in the right. film department? It's just kind of amazing to me, too. It's like oh. when you say there was no way I would have thought that I would have been a professor or a teacher or a writer. Yeah. It's the furthest thing from my, well, uh, it, it just happened because um, I got a grant um, which came through the state um, from the folklorist people um, from the National Endowment for the Arts to start a regional heritage center. Uh -huh. And um, so I here. went to the, down here. Okay. So what the state wanted was, well, they actually were going to give it to Gainesville because there were a lot of interested people and they had this pot of money and I said, no, 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 no. Orlando is the center of all this cultural diversity. We need to start a heritage center or what became a heritage alliance here. So I went to the dean and she said, okay, Let's put it in the dean's office and just let it float and see. This is our, the dean that is the, uh, the our arts dean. and sciences dean, and she said uh, because dean Seidel. Dean Seidel. Oh. So uh, it might grow better if you don't have faculty who have a certain way of thinking about art oh. and things. Just let it be there and see what happens. And so we were able to hire a folklorist, and it just sort of got really fun. And Sterling Von Wagenen, who is the director of the School of Film and Digi Digital Media, and I got a grant together to do some things in the Heritage Alliance, working with film and kids and telling their stories, and which became part of the Heritage Alliance. And he just finally said, why don't you become a film professor? 
And I oh. thought, oh my gosh. And he said, we can take the Heritage Alliance with us and we can work that in with the School of Film and um, well, the Zora Neale Hurston Institute for Documentary Studies. And also now we're developing this master's degree in MFA in documentary and cultural memories. I said, dream job. I have a dream job. In c cultural yeah. memories. Memory. Mm -hmm. And how does that work? Well, I get to ha develop how it works pretty much. But it's sort of this idea that you have something um, that comes from your upbringing and your culture. Retaining you have a way it. of thinking about things uh -huh. and things that are taught to you, rhythms that you have and patterns of um, memory. And then how do you um, manifest that in your physical world? Huh. And it's with the kinds of things like what your stepfather did, making roosters and the caricatures. It's a certain way of moving through the world that you have. And um, what we want is to get kids involved in telling the stories about the, how they see the world. It's and, and loving the aesthetic way that they decorate their rooms or their lockers um, so that we understand Uniquely. that as, yeah. As, as individuals as, as well as collectively as a exactly. culture, both, both exactly. that expression. Yes, uh-huh. And so we look at all kinds of traditional music, we look at um, traditional practices in how you do gardens, how you decorate homes, color combinations, all of those things that can be usually be traced back generations. So uh, if you had a garden, for example, um, you might uh, um, decorate the garden with, uh, um, with smells, for example, that come out at different seasons. Right. Um, so that or certain kinds of herbs that, that you need to cook with. I like this. Are, um, I even in the, the way that you design how the gardens look says a lot about your economic situation or your cultural situation. You might put a shrine in it that has something to do with Arisha worship or Catholicism. Um, but you can tell a whole lot about the people by what they do and how they create their own spaces. In a way, it's almost learning to learn. Yeah. Um, uh, it's sort of a concept of it, it's, it's expanding the way you think about things so that when you come up with a new thing, you can think about it in a different way or a more efficient way right. uh, in yeah. any regard. Yes. Yeah. So, so if you it took a child... Um, who is um, uh, and and taught them about art? They might be good in in research or in right. business or in right. fishing. Right, <laughs> right. And so that they can. S what we did in the modernist times is we took our art and we put it in an isolated places in museums, and we said that art was something certain people do, and it became outside of our lives or that we had to take ourselves to those places to say now we're having an art experience. And I think we've been impoverished, all of us have been impoverished by that, that solitary way of seeing art. And so a large part of what I'm trying to do is bring it back into the, or, have, or recognize the fact that it's in our ritualistic spaces and our everyday lives. What I'm picking up on is something I hadn't thought about before, oh. which is always fun. Yeah. Um, most people think of art as being something that they look at. Yeah, and don't participate and in And don't it. participate in What yeah. I hear you saying yeah. is that art is what you're teaching is the participatory part of art right. and the creative part of all the people that are doing, doing it, it. And involved in it. Ah, yeah. Now so I we're it. recognizing ourselves all of us as creative beings. The, the, the amazing part of this is that uh, we've, never, we've never met before. No. Um, is that uh, I, I teach neuroscience, which seems entirely separate. Right. But it isn't. I hardly know the word. <laughs> Basically, the brain is altered by our experiences in its own wiring. Oh. So what you're saying is that when you have ways of thinking or interacting with your physical world, you get new kinds of wiring. Your shape, your inner wiring is changed. Won't this make us so much better? Sure. Problem solving and Absol being open minded absolutely. and flexible. It makes you, it makes a child better because they have a new way of thinking about something. Right. And, and for example, if you take, uh, um, um, I was uh, taking art, what you said, 
my my dad, uh, who's so influential, uh, Emery Clark, yeah, right. used to do things in layers. Oh. Um, so what do you mean by that? Uh, if you took a um, uh, Fred Flintstone, okay, and you had the tiger suit, and you had the Fred's outline, and you had the the facial features, and you had uh, uh, the whatever, and you put those in a in a stack, you could look through and you could see Fred Flintstone. And so the purpose of that is you could change, if you're doing a series, you could change the feet, oh. and so you can keep the other, you don't oh. have to redraw it. Cartoonists oh. use that huh. that way. Yeah. The, in, a, in a way, neuroscience works in the same way, the way we think, the way we perceive. Um, that is, w you don't see me as me, you see me as a set of features, outline, right. detail, color, right. motion, all separate. When you put it together, it becomes uniquely me. Right. And so if somebody had a stroke, for example, and pulled out a layer, you might see it. You couldn't tell whether it's Fred from, who was it, Barney? Yeah. But you could tell it was not Thelma? Thelma? Wilma. Wilma. I think it was. It wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> Wilma. Yeah. Because you have some degree of discrimination, oh. but you've lost some features. Yes. If you now learn something, you gain another transparency. Now oh. it becomes even more detailed and more detailed and more detailed. So in other words, you see with greater clarity oh. and greater uniqueness. Oh, that's an interesting kind of thing to think about. So it's not what we just see, but it's what our experience that are intertwined. So they get layered on top of one another and they make different kinds of connections. Exactly. Which of course gives you, that's where the new ideas come from. That's where new ideas come from. Yeah. Absolutely. So what we just need to do is keep those wirings all well, alive and give new inputs. Uh, new inputs and new ideas. For example, creativity. Uh -huh. If you take um, uh, creativity, I think um, it's, it, uh, you have to make errors oh. to be creative. Right. Right. Um, if you're not, if you don't make yeah. errors, then what happens is you don't try out new intellectual ideas. Yeah. It's sort of like, a, um, uh, like a, a sort of a Darwinian approach of intellectual mutations. Uh -huh. um, you've got to make mistakes. Sometimes.